Hello everyone, and welcome again to Nettle, the best platform around for distance learning in business, finance, economics, and much, much more. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click that bell notification button below so that you never miss fresh videos and tutorials you might be interested in. Many thanks to our current Patreon supporters for making this video possible, and we would also greatly appreciate if you consider supporting us as well, so please check the link in the description for more details. My name is Sava, and today we are continuing to investigate various GOSH models and various extensions to the GOSH framework that can be used to achieve a better fit in the modeling of volatility persistence and variance clustering. And the topic of our today's investigation is the GOSH in mean, or for short, GOSH M model, that have been proposed by Boleslav, Engel and Wooldridge in 1988. And uh, it uses the very simple and uh, identical logic for the conditional variance equation to the simple GOSH model, where you use the alpha coefficient to model the impact of the immediate disturbance, so the lagged squared residual, and uh, beta to model for the persistence of conditional variance v t squared. However, it applies a very relevant and theoretically important tweak to the mean equation. In all of the previous models, such as ARSH, GOSH, or even other extensions like TGOSH, by the way, check out the video on TGOSH if you're interested, in all of these models, the expected return was treated as a constant, as some value mu that doesn't change with time and is independent of the conditional volatility. However, the logic of asset pricing and uh, financial markets dictates that there might be a positive relationship between expected risk and expected return. That is, agents might require a premium on, in terms of return for holding more risky assets. It means that you could expect the expected return, your RT, to be positively linked with conditional variance VT squared. In the periods of high volatility, the expected return of the market could be higher than the periods of low volatility. And that is what the GASH M model provides for. It includes the term that is proportional to VT squared, the conditional variance, into the mean equation. It states that the expected return at a particular day is dependent on some value mu, as usual, but also is proportional to delta, which is risk premium, that is, how much return would you require for taking on a unit of conditional variance, times the conditional variance itself. And that allows for some powerful generalizations and to generate some powerful inferences from the GASH M model. For instance, it can be used to model expected returns of the market subject to some conditional volatility. And that is a logic that Boleslav, Engel and Wooldridge themselves used to extrapolate what the return of the market could have been in various situations and uh, how agents weigh in their preference towards risk into the calculations of their required return or expected return. So this is quite relevant for finance applications of volatility persistence models. Without further ado, let's figure out how to apply the logic of GASH and mean, or GASH M, in Excel. So let's start with our baseline case, the constant volatility assumption with no impact of conditional variance onto our expected returns. So we start with assuming that our constant is just equal to sample average return, and we are investigating our usual sample of S&P 500 returns from December 2014 until November end 2019, and that our unconditional variance omega is exactly equal to our constant variance that is calculated as standard deviation of returns squared. Here, unlike in usual gosh, we have got one additional parameter to tweak to optimize our log likelihood. As in the simple gauge, you had mu, omega, so constant and unconditional variance, and your usual alpha and beta that factor in in the volatility persistence equation, you also got delta, which is the risk premium that shows, again, how much 
more return would agents require for taking on one extra unit of conditional variance. To start with, we assume that all of these parameters are equal to zero, and uh, we can also figure out what is the value of long-run volatility by adding up alpha and beta together and calculating long-run volatility as the square root of unconditional variance over 1 minus alpha minus beta. And here again, the convergence criterion is the same as with Gauche. That is, you would require both alpha and beta to be from 0 to 1 and the sum of alpha and beta to be less than 1. So without further ado, we can start calculating our expected returns in each and every of our sample observation days by using our constant mu, which is the same throughout the period, and adding up delta, which is the risk premium, times the conditional variance at a particular point in time. And this conditional variance will again be calculated using the Gauche logic. And here we see that if we assume that no uh, risk premium is factoring in to our expected returns, our expected return is the same throughout the period, so nothing pretty much changes, and we can calculate our residuals based on the difference between the observed return and the expected return. We can square these residuals to arrive at realized volatility, so observed values of the disturbance of uh, the error term. We can lag those to better calculate the ARSH component of our conditional variance. We can make the usual assumption that conditional variance at the start is equal to long-run variance, so the equilibrium value of variance, so long-run volatility squared. And uh, further on, we can calculate our conditional variance using the conditional variance equation over here. So unconditional variance omega plus the alpha coefficient, the immediate variance persistent coefficient, times the lag squared residual, plus the beta coefficient, which is the conditional variance persistence coefficient, times the lagged conditional variance. And we can see that as we have inputted parameter values consistent with the constant volatility assumption, uh, our conditional variance stays the same throughout. So can we improve upon this condition? And most importantly, can we improve upon the Gash model results that return the value of log likelihood at 4,390? Well, to figure that out, we have to calculate the log likelihood for each and every of our observations. And uh, here, the log likelihood function is the same as in previous cases. It is just the probability density function of the normal distribution that inputs the values of realized variance epsilon t squared and conditional variance and conditional volatility vt squared and vt respectively. The only change that we apply here is that this log likelihood can be maximized by varying five parameters instead of four in that case, delta, the risk premium, being the obvious addition. So here we can input the natural logarithm of 1 over the square root of 2 times pi times the conditional variance. And given that we need conditional volatility here, inputting conditional variance under the square root would return exactly what we need, times the exponent of minus realized variance, so just the squared residual in the numerator, over 2 times the conditional variance in the denominator. And that would do the job, but here we can also input the trick I have discussed in greater detail in previous videos that would allow our algorithm, our numerical optimization algorithm of gradient descent to converge to optimal parameter values faster and without us specifying the restrictions on parameters manually. So we can use the if error function to return a very high negative number if there is an error in calculations, so it would account for the fact that if the system doesn't converge and uh, the usual solver would return an error and just stop, just break, to prevent that, we can just return a negative number so that solver knows such error situations are to be avoided, and uh, that means that solver would arrive at uh, the optimal solutions faster and without 
much input from our side. So this trick involves us just typing in, for example, minus a thousand if there is an error here, and this would prevent solver from getting into the domains of non-convergence we're not interested in. And here we can bottom right click this all the way down, calculating log likelihood for every single observation. And then we can sum up log likelihood throughout our sample and arrive at 4208 approximately. Now we can calculate our realized and gush M volatilities for each and every observation. Uh, realized volatility would just be the square root of uh, realized variance, so the square root of the squared residual, and the conditional gush M volatility would be the square root of conditional variance over here. And we can bottom like click it all the way down and see how our results compare to the usual gush model output in gray. Obviously here we have inputted the constant volatility assumptions, so our orange line representing gush M is flat so far but it won't be flat for long, as we'll go to solver and try and maximize log likelihood by varying these parameters, uh, mu, omega, alpha, beta, and delta. So we can go data solver, and here specify our task. So our optimization task is to maximize log likelihood, so we input this cell as our objective function, and we want it to reach maximum, we want to change variable cells that represent mu, omega, alpha, beta, and delta. So cell values B5 to B9. As we have uh, implemented the trick with uh, log likelihood function returning minus 1000 when there is an error, we can untick safely this box and input no further manual constraints on the parameters. That was the goal that we pursued by applying this trick. And we can safely select the gradient descent, GRG nonlinear, for solver to converge to optimal values of the parameters. And we can click solve now and wait until the function arrives at the optimal parameter values maximizing log likelihood. And the solver has just converged to optimal parameter values. We can see that the value of the log likelihood has improved to 4393, which is slightly higher than the log likelihood we achieved from simple gush without a regression in mean. We can see that our risk premium delta is positive, which is consistent with the theory. The expected return in high volatility periods should be much higher than the expected return in low volatility periods, and the values of alpha and beta that characterize volatility persistence, immediate and conditional, are very similar to the ones we obtained in usual gush, meaning that the fit improvement is not as tremendous as one might have expected from the implementation of such theoretically motivated concept as risk premium. If we look graphically at how the fit of gush M and gush are different, we can see that gush M is very, very similar to the gray line of gush, with it being almost unobservable behind the gush gray line. Uh, the marginal improvements are here in high volatility periods, where the orange line fits into the peaks of realized volatility a little bit better. And that's why this log likelihood value is so similar to the one we obtained in the usual gush framework. Again, the flexibility of gush M would allow you to consider a wide range of various mean regression equations. For example, who said that the risk premium would reward you linearly for variance? You could consider another equation for expected return. For example, your risk premium could reward you for undertaking not conditional variance, but conditional volatility, VT. And this is also implementable in the Gosh M framework. Here we can just tweak it a little bit so that the expected return rewards us by delta units of expected return, not per unit of variance, but per unit of volatility. So here, instead of our conditional variance, we could multiply by the square root of conditional variance and see how the results change. But obviously, given the fact that square root of conditional variance is much higher than conditional variance, surprise, uh, then we have to uh, adjust this parameter back to zero so that the model doesn't really uh, explode in terms of um, our output. So here we can start with the baseline case again, with our constant being equal to the sample average and unconditional variance being equal 
to the constant variance and delta being equal to zero with the sole change again that we multiply by the square root of conditional variance and not by the variance itself. So here, if we implement it in solver, we can see that uh, our results would be perhaps slightly different, but let's see it for ourselves. And here we can see that we have arrived at a slightly different configuration of our Gush M framework with a different assumption on the risk premium equation. We can see that for each unit of standard deviation, we are rewarded by 0.2% of extra return, extra risk premium, and our value of log likelihood is very, very similar to the one we obtained with the past set of assumptions. And again, the volatility persistence parameters alpha and beta are extremely similar to the ones we obtained previously and are reminding us of the ones we got from simple gush. The only uh, notable change is that here we have got our constant mu treatable as the risk free rate, isn't it? This is the return that we would have obtained if conditional volatility would be zero. This now is negative, meaning that to obtain positive return, you need to take on quite a bit of risk in terms of the standard deviation. But here, the two conflicting assumptions on the mean equation generate quite similar fits. And this can also be seen graphically with the Gush M model very closely mimicking the simple Gush model output in gray, uh, only achieving marginally better fits under the peaks of the realized volatility in blue. Obviously, you could consider other specifications of Gush M. That's why this model is so flexible and so widely used. You can consider logarithmic values of risk premium. So here you can multiply by the natural logarithm of uh, conditional uh, variance, for example. And uh, Excel modeling and solver allows to accommodate for such a wide range of potential assumptions. But again, for S&P 500 returns over these five years, the logic of Gush M, however theoretically appealing it might be, does not deliver a tremendously better fit than the usual Gush model does. And that's all there is for Gush M or Gush in mean modeling in Excel. Please leave a like on this video if you found it helpful. In the comments below, I make it to see any further suggestions for videos in business economics or finance you would like me to record. And please don't forget to subscribe to our channel or consider supporting us on Patreon. Thank you very much and stay tuned.